So far away, Lucas, considering that I am now locked away in my concrete fact bunker at an undisclosed location, um, today's topic is pretty on point. It is. Doomsday Preppers. So far away, Lucas, as you often do, would you like to let the lovely audience at home know what the topic of today's Wiki Weekends is? Go for coffee? Uh, yeah, so we're doing something a bit different today and going through, I believe, like a Wikipedia page about people from Doomsday Preppers. Yes, yeah, so Doomsday Preppers is a TV show. It's an experience, really, that I highly recommend <laughs> to anybody watching this because it's so fucking bad. It is the definition of trash TV. And if you don't know what Doomsday Preppers is, allow me to illuminate you on that matter. So Doomsday Preppers was an American reality TV series that aired on the National Geographic channel from 2011 to 2014. It's like, it's really sad as well when you hear stuff like National Geographic and Doomsday Preppers. Yeah, that is not what TV show I imagine being on there. It's like when you go look at the History Channel and it's just fucking ancient aliens. And you're like, really? Really, History Channel? It's like, all you talk about is Hitler and aliens. It's like, God damn it! Get different interests. Anyway, the program profiles various survivalists or preppers. Now, it's really difficult to like, do big air quotes and I've got a coffee and a phone, but you know what? I'll make it work. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying my best, folks. And then, who are preparing to survive the various circumstances that may cause the end of civilization, including economic collapse, societal collapse, and electromagnetic pulses. The quality of their preparations is graded by the consulting company, Practical Preppers, who provide analysis and recommendations for improvements. Uh, so, Lucas, first of all, thoughts? It is just heroic, the levels that people will go to. And they go to these levels specifically to cater for one outcome. Yeah, for incredibly specific scenarios. And admittedly, we are now currently living in the midst of a global pandemic, but... I think a tweet that sums it up that I saw is, it's really strange living today because it's the end of the world, but you can get Starbucks. <laughs> All these people who spent years talking about how when the end of the world came, they'd be ready and they'd do anything they could, anything in their power to survive and like, you know, propagate. And mm -hmm. they're asked, well, just wear this small piece of fabric over your face. Like, no! No, I can't do that. How dare you tell me to do that? That's against my human rights. Anyway, it, I'm going to carry a gun around this fucking Starbucks. Right. So, and we have to say some information about the show. So, genre reality. Oh, God, that word's doing a lot of heavy lifting now. I'll be, I'll be honest, mate. It is because uh, I'm not sure they're living in fucking reality. Right, so, when we get into the discussions of the actual people on the show, you'll see that they are about as detached from reality as it gets. Country of origin, the United States. We didn't even need to say that. It was implied. Lucas, before we get onto the discussion of the episodes and the people contained in them, um, like, what are your thoughts on the end of the world? Because I, I'm to the mindset that some of the things these people do or prepare for or are prepared to do in the event of an apocalypse, like, that's worse than just dying. Mm -hmm. It's like, if there was a meteor about to hit the Earth now, if I looked out my window, which I can see, and just saw a meteor coming, to, I'd run towards it. Is that, cause I don't want to live in a world where I've got to eat fucking earthworms. Is that I'm too I'm too comfortable. If it was something I had a little bit more time to you know prepare for, in the sense of like, if it's if I turned on the news and it was like, you know, zombie apocalypse, Shaun of the Dead style, it's scary. I think the first thing I would do is like run to the closest shop, grab as much alcohol as I can, and then just get <laughs> drunk and play Halo until I die. Which is what I've already talked about doing in a previous video, but we'll get here. It's like, they've got, there's a reception to it, and it's like, Doomsday Preppers has received varied reviews. Um, the New York Times condemned it as an absurd excess on display at what an easy target the Prepper worldview is for ridicule, noting <laughs> how offensively anti-life these shows are, and they are full of contempt for mankind. <laughs> um, which I can speak to, because I've watched every episode of this show, and... One of the things you'll notice when you're watching it is how many people on it seem genuinely excited at the idea of societal breakdown just so mm. they'll have the excuse to shoot somebody. Like an episode that sticks in mind is a guy who buys a missile silo and lives inside of it. He's like, well, I need to think of a way to protect my missile silo from outside attack. He's like, mate, it's a fucking missile silo. It's already... <laughs> 
like, you know, immune to attack from the outside. It's 40 foot underground. And he builds, not like a security camera system, not like, you know, like puts thicker doors on the outside. He puts a flamethrower on the inside. So he's already anticipating people breaking in. And he sits there as this flamethrower goes off. He's like, yeah, I'd love to see the looters try and get through this one. It's like, why are you actively getting hard at the idea of burning someone to death, you fucking weirdo? Oh, God. And that is the perfect example of the type of people you're probably going to encounter in this TV show. And it's the type of people you'd presumably encounter in an apocalypse, which I go back to my point of, why would you want to live in that world? Anyway, um, episodes. So we've got just brief um, uh, recaps of each episode, and we'll go through a few and we'll just discuss um, what's encountered. So episode one, pilot. Dennis McClung and his family show their backyard food production system known as the Garden Pool. Lisa Bedford, the survival mom, uh, takes urban preparation to a new level, preparing for a financial collapse. And the Cobbler and Hunt families combine forces in order to ensure food production through an economic collapse. Uh, so that's like all about like food production and stuff like that. And those parts of the show are always the best to me. Because mm. some of the like solutions people to come up with, I, I, I prefer death to them. Like one guy's like, <laughs> look, I've figured out a perfect sustainable food source. And it zooms in on this big box full of worms. It's like... Worms are great. Worms and cockroaches are the future. And I look and go, if I had to sit down and eat some fucking earthworm and chips for the fifth <laughs> night on trot, I'd be like, no, I'm going to go outside and just face oblivion. It's preferable <laughs> to this life. You know what? I'm just going to instead walk into this like suspicious looking Mr. Silo, see what happens. <laughs> just see like fucking 2020 end it all, man. The next episode, David Sarty, a YouTube firearms instructor, and firearms instructor is in big like, air quotes, and self-taught <laughs> survivalist, is prepared for an electrical grid failure. So like, I get that. Like, that, that makes sense. Like, oh, the electrical grid might fail. What are you going to do? Are you going to like, you know, get a generator? It's like, no, I'm going to get a fucking gun and shoot my neighbours. <laughs> Yeah, that's all, that, immediate. Every, every single episode, like he's like, oh, so what are you preparing for? And I said, like, oh yeah, like, a collapse of some kind. So, so mm -hmm. what are you going to do in that situation? You're going to like, you know, if you work with your neighbours uh, to come up with a solution that can keep you all. Like, no, I don't trust anyone. I got a gun. <laughs> like, Great. That's going to make everything so much better. A fucking gun. I can't wait until the only thing that's left in the apocalypse is all of these psychopaths with guns and just wait to see what happens. All right, um, the one that I like, though, is uh, because this is one of those weird things where I think it got really popular. Probably it's got even more popular now, given, like, you know, uh, the times that we live in. But mm -hmm. you get, like, young people who have no ability to prepare. Because a lot of the times it is just people who live in rural areas and have, like, vast swathes of land. And yeah. they'll spend, like, their life savings, in some cases, building, like, underground bunkers. Like, you live in the middle of bumfuck nowhere as it is. Why do you need to go <laughs> underground? No one knows where you are. And the one that always struck me is, I think it's a young girl or a young guy who they live in New York and their plan is to get a fucking canoe. <laughs> and they have, like, this shitty one-bedroom apartment with that's, that is 90% canoe that they have because they are so terrified that the world's going to end and they're going to drag this canoe through downtown New York and like go along the Brooklyn River because they think the bridges are going to be filled with cars. It's like, you don't even own a car, just fucking walk. <laughs> and like, the end of the episode is them on the river in this canoe. Like, I didn't think this through. It's like, of course you didn't. Because <laughs> they get asked, do you know how to canoe? No, but I think... When the situation arises, I'd learn in the moment. And the no. episode's like, you should probably learn how to use your canoe if this is your only plan for escape. And we'll skip ahead a couple episodes. Into the Spider Hole, episode 7, season 1. Doug Huffman is prepared, teaching techniques for surviving a second depression based upon America's massive debts. Fair. Like, the, the only thing about this is, they don't tell you the stupid stuff that these people do. They just tell yeah. you what they're preparing for. And that's fair enough. But... I want them to go into the details of the shit that people do, such as just buying hundreds of rabbits. Because there's like one episode where a guy <laughs> buys a bunch of rabbits. Like, yeah, rabbits are a sustainable food source. You can look after them. They can live in a small cage. Completely oblivious to the fact that rabbits are possibly one of the worst sources of protein mm -hmm. possible. Um, to the point where there is something known as rabbit starvation, which is a unique form of starvation that 
happens to people when they consume a diet full of exceptionally lean protein like rabbit, where you can literally die of malnutrition with a stomach full of food. And this guy's like, I'm gonna prepare for the apocalypse with fucking rabbits. And you see him, he's got kids. And he's like teaching his kids like, oh, you like the rabbit, don't you? One day you'll have to kill it. And it's like, fucking hell. Oh man. Teach your kids some optimism, you absolute monster. Episode eight, it's gonna get worse. Bruce Beach, a lifelong prepper, is focused on nuclear war and saving children in his 42 underground buses. <laughs> oh, Luke <God>, <laughs> Lucas, would you trust a man who's like, don't worry I, about the apocalypse, I can save all of your children if you come live with me in my underground bus emporium. <laughs> oh, uh, am I nuts or are you? Um, uh, season two, episode um, uh, two. Jason Beecham is a 15 year old boy who's been prepping for economic collapse since age 11. It's like, fucking get a game by night. Fucking hell. Just like, imagine losing your, like the literal best years of your life because you saw some YouTube videos that made you insane. Yeah. I'm so glad that YouTube's like, you know, cracks down on that kind of thing. <laughs> oh man, that's like, you know what? Like we can, like, I think people get the idea now, but we can end on talking about my favorite episode of Doomsday Preppers. And Lucas, like we briefly discussed it on the podcast. Mm. Who do you think I'm going to mention? Oh, is it going to be the sewer man? <laughs> it's sewer man. So... For everyone viewing this video, if you watch just one episode of Doomsday Preppers, track down the episode where it is the guy who works in a family-owned barbecue restaurant who literally thinks that Red Dawn is going to happen. And for people who don't know, Red Dawn, in the original, uh, and for people who don't know, Red Dawn is a film in which the Soviet Union in the 80s version and North Korea in the reboot um, invade mainland USA and take it over. Um, which is really ridiculous, right, Lucas? Uh, yeah, like, pretty much. The idea of someone, even Russia, invading the continental US and taking it over is ridiculous, yeah. right? Well, mm -hmm. uh, the guy in that episode is even stupider than that because he doesn't believe it's going to be a foreign power. He believes it's going to be ISIS. You know, oh, like that barely held together group of terrorists halfway across the world. He <laughs> thinks they are going to invade and take over the entire United States. And in that episode, he talks about how... Um, ISIS will no doubt um, defeat the military. You know, the strongest, most powerful military on earth. Like, they, they're going to beat SEAL Team 6, according to this guy. And the only <laughs> way that America is going to endure is if people like him, an overweight guy with a beard, fight back. And his plan to do that <laughs> is he hides in the sewer with a fucking bow and arrow. <laughs> it's like... Like, I don't think anything highlights the level of delusion on display by some of the people on that show where you have this overweight guy with a bow and arrow thinking, I will be able to take back America from the people who take out SEAL Team 6. The people <laughs> who defeat the standing army of the United States so handily that they have no ability to counteract it. I am going to take them out from the sewers and like he has a girlfriend who has fucking diabetes or some shit. And he hides diabetes medicine in the sewers. Oh, no. And it's just, you feel so bad for his family. It's like, we just want to run a barbecue restaurant, but our son keeps nicking barbecue sauce and hiding it in the sewer. Oh, God damn it. But it's just, like, and again, I just ask people, like, if it gets to the point where the fucking army get defeated by this, like, foreign influence, like, what chance do you stand? Because I'll be honest, if I turned on the TV tomorrow and I saw a news report about how like, a terrorist group had taken over the entire United Kingdom and they defeated our entire army, including the SAS, I'd go, well, I guess they just wanted it more. <laughs> they would. I wouldn't think that... I wouldn't think... If I go hide in the sewers with a stick, I can beat the guys who beat the SAS. <laughs> it's so... It's like, what... The show is amazing, but... Um, the one last thing I want to mention, though, is just the episode where he's a descendant of, like, the Hatfield clan, I think it is. And she's talking about how she wants to defend her property, so she builds a trebuchet that fires ninja stars. <laughs> <laughs> and in the episode, like, they set up, like, three mannequins about 12 foot away that don't move. 
And she fires this trebuchet at them and it hits like one in the leg and the other one gets grazed on the head. She goes, yeah, I'd like to see someone stand up to that. It's like, you mean walk left? <laughs> it's like, you can avoid this by taking one step to the right. <laughs> so, well, that show's amazing. 